Well read. Thank you so much. Good morning, church family. My voice is a lot stronger this Sabbath. Thanks to uh, Dr. Arturo Rodriguez. If you don't know him, you should get to know him. He has a, a, an office right here in Port Charlotte, and he's a member of our church. I think right now he's worshiping with the Spanish church, but he, uh, he, said, he said one day, Ben, if you get sick, you just give me a call. And you know, you don't want to bother people, but you know what I realized? I am sick. I'm going to call him. And he worked me in, and I'm just so grateful and thankful. Listen, uh, God does not want us to do life alone. God wants to, there's many of us here to support each other, amen? I'm not a doctor. I can't physically help you. I can't prescribe medication. As a pastor, I can help you with other things, right? But we all work together, and we support each other. And that's the beauty of God's church. Well, dear ones, it's good to be with you. It's good to feel well. It's good to, uh, to worship with you. I want to thank you, everybody, for playing the music so beautifully. Nancy, always such a blessing. Um, I want to thank Wave for a, a, just, a, just a supportive elder, just a wonderful, you know, this church. I can't imagine this church without Wave Williams or, or, or Ann. They just, this, is, this is Port Charlotte. These are, these are some of the fixtures of the wonderful people that God has blessed this church with. Um, I'm trying to think of just one more announcement before we get into the word. And that is, how many of you heard that Barb Huff fell last night and broke her hip? Okay, so some of you know. Last night, Barb fell around midnight or so. She broke her hip. Lee was able to, uh, to call. You know, Lee's pretty much bound to a chair at this time. Um, he's dealing with his own health issues. And, you know, this precious couple that's precious to our church, um, as frail as they are, God brought a bunch of resources. And um, Barb has surgery tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I was in her hospital room this morning with my son, Gage. And we said, what do you want me to tell the church family? Do you want me to tell them to come visit you? And they said, if you want to come visit Barb, you can have a whole steady stream of people. Room 204 in Fawcett Memorial Hospital. Um, you can show your love to her if you'd like to. They don't have to, but please, everybody, let's be praying tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. is when they'll have the surgery. At this point, I believe Barb has two shoulders and one already one replacement hip. She'll have, this is the new hip. She's two, three million dollar woman. This is... <laughs> this side of heaven, you know, it's, uh, um, that we get more valuable over time. And so we just, we want to keep our sister Barb in our prayers. And I thank you for doing that. All right, dear ones, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Not that's hitting, hitting home. I want to thank, uh, reiterate what Wave said. Thank you for all who came out to the, um, the work bee. I felt very bad not being there, um, but I was, I was pretty under the weather. And my wife went and my kids went, and they worked super hard in my stead, and I'm just thankful that they, they represented so well. As it is, I think I pretty much got some members of our staff sick this week because I came in for a staff meeting. I, I'm having a hard time staying away, but if you needed me this week and I didn't come, it's because I want to share blessings and not curses. I didn't want you to get sick, so keep that in mind. Let's get into God's Word. Let's pray. Oh, loving Lord, as we enter into your Word, I am reminded that these are not my words. These are your words. These are the words of life. Lord, these are your people. These are not my people. These are your people. Port Charlotte SDA Church belongs to you, Lord. And this is your day. And so I ask in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit would take total control. Father, I am pleased and happy to be your servant. And I ask that you to hide me behind the cross. Fill me with the Spirit. And do something for this gathering that we desperately need. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you love telemarketers when they call. I see a hand. No, no, <laughs> he's scratching his head. And no, nobody likes to be interrupted by a telemarketer. How many of you like it when a uh, random person knocks on your door and is trying to sell something? Raise your hand in the last year if you have bought anything from somebody who knocked on your door. Impressive. What'd you buy? You brought what? Bought what? You bought a rainbow vacuum cleaner. Listen, listen, if anyone goes door to door, get her number, because that's, that's, that's who you want to talk to. Listen, when I was, when I was a call porter um, many years ago, my wife and I, we were call porters. In fact, I have, we're joined today by Tekoa and Zach and Katie. Um, this is a Tria's family and my family, and Tekoa and I, we, we worked together as call porters. We had a lot of fun. I remember one year, um, we were working in Montgomery, Alabama, and Tria was actually the program head, so she was the leader of some, some young adults who were leading younger kids, like 15, 16, 17, 18, to knock on strangers' doors and sell Christian books. You folks know what call porters are? In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we sell, you know, uh, Ellen White books and, and uh, health books and all kinds of things. 
And that's how Tree and I went through school, basically. At Tacoa, we went through school. It's, it, it can be intense work. I was also a, um, for a period of time, I was also a uh, telemarketer, and I realized that's terrible. That's terrible. I, I, I only did that job for a couple months, and I realized I can't live with myself if I keep doing this job. But, but knocking on doors, strangers' doors for Jesus, even though that could be difficult, it was worth it. And I had been doing it long enough that at that time, Tree was the program head, and I was the Bible worker. And one of the things call porters do is when they knock on your door, if you'll give them the time of day, they'll ask, are you interested in cooking schools? Are you interested in Bible studies? And they'll get your interest, and they will give it to a Bible worker or the local church. I was the Bible worker that summer, and you know what? I got hundreds. You don't realize it in your community. I'm sure the church, the Montgomery First Alabama SDA Church, did not realize that there were hundreds of people in their community that wanted to study the Bible. But when you systematically knock on every door in a town, you hear from people and where they're at. And so we would get these interests, and I would follow up these interests. And did you know, I'd follow up every interest. Have you ever been to Montgomery, Alabama? Anybody ever? Do you know that, Mon yeah, that Montgomery, Alabama is, is, a historic, is a historic place? It was, uh, wasn't Loretta Scott King and the, the bus uh, the boycott of Montgomery? Didn't, didn't uh, Martin Luther King Jr. on the steps of, of the, the courthouse? I mean, this was a very special place in the civil rights movement of, of yesteryear. And so Montgomery, Alabama, if you've ever been there, you know the I-85 cuts through. North of I-85, for the most part, is, the, I'd say, Caucasian community. South of I-85 is, for the most part, African-American community. This, the highway divides Montgomery and Montgomery, Alabama. Very interesting city. Well, as I'm going through and I'm, I'm following up these leads, the, the call porters knocked on every door in Montgomery. The ones of north, the ones of south, the ones everywhere. But do you know who would give me the time of day? It wasn't the northern um, uh, above the uh, I-85. I would knock on their door. I'd, I'd come back and I'd say, hey, you showed an interest in a Bible study. And I would get maybe one or one to probably five rejections for every one. Even though they filled it out and they said they were interested, I would only get called back to go to one of those, one out of every five, basically. But you know what, what I found? The ones in the south, below I-85, the ones where I stuck out like a sore thumb and I didn't look a part of that community, guess what? Almost 100% of the people who indicated that they wanted to study the Bible would meet with me at least once or twice, if not the entire summer, to study the Bible. And it happened over and over and over again. And you've got to understand that I'm from, I'm from out west. I'm, listen, I don't know anything about, about anything. I grew up in Utah. <laughs> The, 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 the history of the East and, and the North and South, that, that's lost on people who were born and raised in Utah and California, um, for the most part. And so I didn't really appreciate what was going on, but as at the end of the summer, I remember I had this one precious Bible study, and she worked at the courthouse, and she was so wonderful. She was, she was a professional. I think she may have even been a judge, and she faithfully, we studied the Bible together all summer long, all summer long. I was just a kid, maybe what was I, Tria? We were just married that summer. Actually, you want to get this? We were married that very summer. Our, our first house was the mother's room of the Montgomery STA Church. That's, that's where we lived, like in the mother's room. It was, it was crazy. Anyhow, um, my point in sharing that is when I met with this woman, at the end of the summer, I said, hey, could you help explain something to me? And she goes, whatever, whatever I can help you with, Ben. I said, why do you think it is? that of all the people that indicated they wanted to study the Bible, when I came back through, that I got almost 100% of the people who said they wanted to study the Bible actually met with me to study with me south of I-85, and the people north of me, it was nothing. She goes, well, I don't know. I don't really know what was going on north, but I can tell you why I wanted to study the Bible with you. And I said, tell me. She goes, Ben, if you were another brother knocking on the door of my home, I wouldn't think anything of it. People knock on the door of my house all the time. I get phone calls all the time. But when a young white kid knocks on the door of my house in this community, that piqued my interest. And I said, I don't know what this guy thinks about what the Bible teaches, but I want to hear what he has to say because no little white kid has ever knocked on my door offering to study the Bible. And I was like, well, thank you for making that clear. Brothers and sisters, we don't always, I don't always bring up race, and I won't always bring up race. Um, but in this particular passage, 
This passage, if you miss the prejudicial uh, attitude in this passage, you're not reading the Bible correctly. And so when we go to John chapter 4, verse 1, this, this whole thing is built on prejudice and how Jesus is about to break it down and save someone who thought that day they would never, they, they had no idea this was coming. This was a big surprise to them. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Now, Jesus is early in his ministry. He doesn't want to go, he doesn't want to cross swords with the Pharisees just yet. He's, he's, already, he's already kicked them out of the temple. He's, he's already said some, some choice words to them. But he's not going to stick around in Judea um, because he knows that it's going to heat things up too fast. As it was, how many of you know that in the, in the Gospels, the Jews, the Pharisees, the leading uh, scribes and priests of, of that area, many times they tried to kill Jesus long before they put him on the cross. They were going to stone him, and he slipped away. So Jesus, Jesus knew that his death on the cross would be at the fulfillment of prophetic time, and it wasn't time. So he, this is what the Bible says. It says, but he needed to go through Samaria. He had to go to Samaria. So Judea is south, Galilee is north. And he's going to leave Jerusalem, where, where John the Baptist in, was working just outside, you know, in, in, near the River Jordan. He's going to leave that area because things are heating up too fast, and he's going to head to Galilee. Now, if you're, a, if you're a careful Jew, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever driven through East L.A.? Anybody? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, some people. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, um, partly. And we went, I lived in Van Nuys, which is not the best part of Los Angeles, California. And, and there were just certain areas where you shouldn't go. You shouldn't go to these areas because it doesn't really matter what you look like or who you are. If you don't belong there, you may not be welcome there. Is that fair? And so, I, so really, for the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, and for specifically the Samaritans, the Samaritans lived in an area called Samaria right, right in the middle, right ab uh, above Judea. But, and then there was Galilee, which was another Jewish community. And, and for the Jews, they could either go to the right of Samaria or they could go to the left of Samaria. But very, very, very few Jews traveled through Samaria. And, and let me explain why. Um, if you were living, if you were going through, say, I don't know, let's talk about Pakistan or, or uh, let's talk about um, Iraq. Uh, maybe there's another area, Saudi Arabia. Would you put a huge red cross on your shirt and walk through those areas? Why not? Would you, why wouldn't you do that? Because, because there's been some history, and that big red cross doesn't mean salvation and hope. And, and, and when, when those areas of the world saw that big red cross, that was anything but Jesus, amen? And so you and I probably wouldn't do that. Just like you and I probably, if we were a Jew, wouldn't travel through Samaria. But Jesus says, even though he's a Jew, he needed to go through what? Through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Is Jacob and Joseph, are they Samaritans? Are Jacob and Joseph Samaritans? What were they? They were Jews. These were, these were the descendants of Abraham. These are people who God called Abraham from the land of uh, Ur of the Chaldees. He made a promise to him, your descendants will be like the sand of the sea. And so how are Samaritans living in the land where the literal wells that are dug there were dug by Jews? How are Samaritans? That's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. It's okay. We have, I don't know if it's helpful. We do have a mother's room and we have a training chapel. But I don't know if that's helpful to you, but... So we have, um, what do you think? How, how do you think Samaritans were living where Joseph dug the wells? What happened? Let me ask you a question. If you're living in your home, does someone else move in on top of you? But what happens if you move out? Tree and I moved out of our farm in Lakeland. And we recently we talked to our, our mortgage company because we're selling the house. And they were surprised to find out we were no longer living there. And they were frustrated for a moment because they were like, well, have you, have you taken steps to make sure no squatters live there? And, and they were worried because that's part of their financial interest as well. What, what's the danger when you move out of your house? The danger is that if you move out, someone might just say, this looks like a nice place to live. We're going to move in. 
So the Jews, and this happened a long time ago, long before Jesus was born, the Jews were so unfaithful to God that after um, Solomon, after his, after his reign, the, the Jewish nation split. It split to Judea um, and Israel, Israel in the north, and the tribes of Judea south. And the, the people of God were so, so disobedient, so um, idolatrous, that God warned them, if you don't obey, if you don't follow, if you don't trust me and obey my word, then I'm going to take the promised land from you. You're only the promised people if you keep to the promises, amen? And so he takes them out, and they're living in, in, in um, I think that this time it was Assyria. They were, it was, this was the captivity. This was where they were drug off to. And guess what? Eventually, God always, if God punishes us, it's not to destroy us. It's to redeem us, amen? God punished the people, but it was to bring them back, bring them back to the source of life. And when they came back, guess who was living in their homes? Guess who was drinking from their wells? Guess who's eating from their vineyards? The Samaritans. And what's interesting is the ancient Near Eastern kings, when they would do this to a population group, it wasn't just the Jews. Um, they, they, would, they would enslave. They would take these people. So if you lived in Florida, they would take you out of Florida. They would move you to Alabama. They'd take the people in Alabama. They'd move them to Florida. And they would mix everything up so that you don't feel comfortable where you're at. And the people who are in control is the central government. Does that make sense? In this case, it would have been Assyria or in other times Babylon. And that's the, that's the way the kings would disrupt things or people groups that wanted to fight and not pay their taxes. And so what's interesting is the Samaritans, even though they moved into this area of Judea, they, they had their own gods, they had their own thoughts, but guess who the kings would always leave behind? Daniel and his friends, were they the crippled? Were they the old? Were they the, the feeble? Daniel and his friends were carted off to Babylon because they were the youngest and the brightest and the best. The ancient Near Eastern kings would leave the people who couldn't put up a fight, take the people who might be able to put up a fight, and when they brought the other people group in, the people who were there, they're the older, they were the, the, the feeble, they were the, the, the handicapped, they were the, they were the, the socially um, incapable, the whatever it was, but they, guess what? They were still Jews, and they still loved God, and they still knew what the Bible taught. And you've got to imagine that the people who were left, God probably left them there because they they didn't need to go. They were always faithful to him. Amen. And so you have this mix of foreigners with Jews and they intermarry and over time they become Samaritans. How many of you guys like uh, clean drinking water? Anybody? How many particulates are you willing to drink when you go to drink your water? How clear does it need to be? How good does it need to be? Are you willing to drink water that's somewhat murky? You know, we've gotten so spoiled, right, in the 21st century. But the truth is, you and I don't, we don't, and, and guess what? In this story, the Jews were like, listen, it's not enough that you love Moses and you, you obey, or trying to obey the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. You're not Jewish. You're a half-breed. You don't belong. Have you guys ever felt like you, there's, there's a population group that doesn't accept you? Have you ever felt like, maybe did you marry into a family and you just weren't good enough? Or maybe it's your spouse and they've been trying all this time to live up to the in-laws' expectation. Something happened in this story and the Jews and the Gentiles got to a point where they would not even sit in the same chairs. They would not eat off the same silverware. Do you realize in the 21st century, do you know what a halal market is? It's, it's in my understanding, it's, that it's an Islamic or a Muslim market where things have to be a certain way. And then there's the Jewish side of things. And, or maybe I got that all wrong. There's, there's, is, Muslims have very careful dietary things. Jews have very careful dietary things. And they will only buy food and eat food in certain places. It has to be purim. It has to be right. It has to be kosher, right? Well, it's no different. Back in Jesus' day, it was just, it was way more rampant because that's all there was. It wasn't a secular society. It was a very religious society. And Jesus had to go to Samaria and there he finds, he finds that he's tired. By the way, uh, Samaria may have been north of Judea, but it was actually, the, what, the way it worked is he was a, it was a hike to get here. It wasn't an easy thing. How many of you like hiking? Anybody like hiking? Like, I like hiking, but living in flat Florida for long enough, my blood is thinned and my legs don't know how to hike. And when I went home, we went sledding for a couple days, or one day, we sledded for guess how long? 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes was plenty of sledding for a Florida family like us. I went down the hill like two or three times, and then I prayed that my kids did not want me to go down the hill with them again. Right? 
Brothers and sisters, Jesus himself knows what it's like to be like us. And the Bible says that he was being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which means it was about noon. Folks, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been hiking and you're exhausted and it's the heat of the day, what do you want? I want a drink of water. Tree and I, um, the, our first anniversary, we were hiking in, um, in Yosemite National Park in California, and we ran out of water on our hike. And it, was, it got to the point where I'm carrying Tria. I'm, carrying, I'm, I'm literally, we, we, we had like two backpacks in Tria. And, and I, we would leapfrog. I would bring the back pack, drop it, go back, get the other pack. And we were leapfrogging because we ran out of water. And without water, you run out of strength. And by the time we finally got to the water, it was like, thank you, Jesus. We're gonna, I thought we were going to die. I thought, well, this is it. This is it. Well, dear ones, the Bible says here that Jesus himself was so thirsty, he was exhausted. And at that time, at noon, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, why is the Bible specific about a woman of Samaria? It's not just a person of Samaria. It's a woman of Samaria. You know, our world will be prejudiced even if we are the exact same ethnic background. Even if we have the exact same skin color, we're going to find something to be different about. Is that fair? That's, that's the nature of man. Mankind is, we are the most prejudicial beings on earth. We, it doesn't really matter. Well, then you make more, you make less, or you think this, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. We'll find some reason to hate each other. Is that fair? And in the days of the Jews and, and, and the Samaritans in Jesus' day, not only were Samaritans and Jews didn't talk, but guess who really didn't talk? Meaning, a male Jew would never open their mouth to a female Samaritan. That, this woman probably has never heard a Jewish male voice. This just doesn't happen, especially a rabbi. And listen to what the Bible says. He says to her, give me a drink. Dear ones, when I was a call porter one time, I was, it was hot, it was the middle of the day, it was, it was miserable, and I was so thirsty, I knocked on this door, and this man did not want to be interrupted, and he was rude. I mean, I tried to give him a book, and he was like, get out of here, you know, I, I don't have time for you. And so I dropped down, I tried to give him a littler book, and I said, sir, we just leave this for just a few dollars. And he's like, I don't have any time for you, you get out of here, or I'm going to basically call the police. Like, he was, he was getting upset, and he was getting mean. And I'm like, oh, he's going to let a dog out on me, which has happened. And so... So I'm thinking things are about to get bad, but I felt impressed to ask him because I was so thirsty. I said, sir, do you mind if I just have a glass of water? And you know what? He looked at me like, Ugh, like I hate you, but I, I'll do that. So he went inside and he got a glass of water and I know just what he did. He got a glass of tap water, but he took the glass out of the sink. And I know it came out of the sink because it had marinara sauce it had marinara sauce on the inside of the glass. And I don't know anybody who serves marinara sauce in a glass. So it had to be soaking in a dirty sink with last night's dinner. And it was along the thing. And the water wasn't cold. It was from this tap. And I'm looking at this marinara sauce floating in the water. And I was so thirsty. You know what I did? Thank you. I drank that down. And you know what that man did when he saw me do that? He changed. He changed because now he felt really bad <laughs> that I wasn't just trying to sell him a book and this was a ploy to buy for more time, that I was desperate for water. And I was so desperate, I was willing to drink his marinara water. <laughs> and you know what that man did? He totally changed. He started talking to me and he bought a bunch of my books. <laughs> when I read this story and Jesus says, give me a drink, I think of that story that happened to that man who had no time for me and who pretty much hated me, but his heart changed when he saw how I was in need. Look what the Bible says. It says, give me a drink. And then verse 8 says, for his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. That's not telling you where the disciples, that, that, that Jesus was also hungry. That's telling you that the only way he could say to a Samaritan woman in that setting, give me a drink, is if the disciples, if the church wasn't there. How many, how many of you guys, if you saw me walking out of a bar would have problems with that. I hope you raise your hand, all right? But if, but if I was there to meet with someone 
who needed to study the Bible. And, and, and God worked it out so that I met them at the bar. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, there's certain things that, that if the church sees it, they're going to say, uh-uh, uh-uh. You, a Jewish man, don't talk to a Samaritan woman. They would not have let this happen. And there's more evidence for that in the Bible in just a couple verses. But so the, the, the disciples, the early church left, and that gave Jesus freedom to share the gospel. And this is what happens. He says, give me a drink. And the woman of Samaria said to him, <laughs> wait a minute, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Like, does she know how things work? Is she aware that this is strictly verboten? This doesn't happen. This, no, 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 no. What is wrong with you? Did you just, did you hit your head on the way here? You are a Jew and you're a male. I'm female and I'm a Samaritan. How dare you ask me for a drink of water? Like, are, are you crazy? And then Jesus says this to us. And then he says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Actually, the translation says, the Jews won't use the same utensils as Samaritans. They had nothing. They won't even use inanimate objects that might be transferred between the people groups. And the Bible says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it you being a Jew? And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is to, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Brothers and sisters, it's time to really think about what Jesus is doing here. It's time to really ask ourselves, what's the parallel lesson for us in the 21st century? You see, you and I know that there is a beef between African American and Caucasian American due to what happened hundreds of years ago because of slavery. You and I know that in our culture, there's a beef between Democrats and Republicans. You and I know all these things that you've got to draw, you have got to be born yesterday not to know that there are a lot of reasons why Christians don't talk to this group or this group doesn't talk to that group. And how many of you, if, if we were to have a pew full of people who, who were same-sex oriented and they came to church today, how many of you would wonder, just, you would be having a hard time listening to the sermon because you're like, oh, what are they doing here? Do you understand what I'm saying? In God's, in, in God's view, he's trying to help the church, our church today, because this story is recorded, he's trying to help us understand that the gospel is for everyone. And the good news applies to everyone, regardless of age, regardless of sex, regardless of these things. And, and, and the church today still struggles with this. And yet Jesus is about to blow this wide open and show us, even down to today, how he really feels and how he really works. The woman of Samaria knew that Jews and Gentiles don't get, I mean, Jews and Samaritans don't get along. And Jesus answered and said to her, actually, you know a lot of things, but you don't know this. If you just knew who the gift of God was and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, two things have happened in the last five minutes for this woman that don't happen. A Jew asks her for something and then a Jew offers to give her something as special as living water. This has never happened in this woman's life. Today is the weirdest day of her life. By the way, why do you think it was that she drew water at noon? All right, I'm, I'm male, so I can't really relate, but I've watched this for a lot. Of, for 40 years, I've observed this. Females like to flock together. Is that fair? Women, when, when in high school, you know what I mean? They all want to go to the bathroom at the same time. Does that mean that all their, they need to go to the bathroom at the same time? No, it's just, we just want to do, they just want to do things together. You know, it's, it's so true. It, it's, it doesn't matter what age you are. Uh, Hope and Tria, ready for this? Tria gets, gets up at 4.30 in the morning to get ready to go to work. And guess who gets up with her? Hope, not Gage, not me. No, we're male. <laughs> we sleep. But little female Hope gets up. And you know what Hope will do? She'll make a little bed in the, on the kitchen, on, on the bathroom floor. She'll bring a blanket and lay down just next to Hope, I mean Tria, while she's getting ready for work. She just wants to be next to her. So here's a woman who's going to the well all alone. That is not normal. Do you, know, do you, do you feel me? That is not normal. That's not how God created women. Women support each other. Women talk about everything. I mean, the best thing, I think, one of the favorite pastimes of women is to talk about their husbands. And this woman's had five of them. She has some things to talk about, right? And, and, but there's no one to talk to. And she does, she's, she's going at noon. I can tell you the truth that not only was she a Samaritan woman, and that was a barrier enough for Jesus, 
as a, as a rabbi and a Jew and a male. There's another area to the story. She wasn't even accepted in her village of Samaritans. She was a reject by the Jews, and she was a reject by her own. And she would go to the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, and draw water, which is laborious. This was a 100-foot well that, that Jacob had dug. 100 feet she'd have to pull water up. And how many of you like to take long baths? Anybody? Anybody? How many of you like to take long showers? I'm not naming any names, but there's a member of my family that if they could shower for two hours, they would. Right? Do you know how much water it takes just to do life, to cook food, to wash yourself, to drink? Right? The women in that day, in the first century, they were the ones. The men were in the field planting and, and ter- caring for the animals, but the women went and they got the water. And what, day, what time of day would the women get the water? Morning or evening, and it was a social thing. It was time to gather, it was time to talk, and they would be talking and talking and gathering the water and, and you know, spreading it out, and it was a social thing. And this woman comes in the heat of the day, and Jesus had to go to Samaria because God told him, told him, Son, there's somebody who needs to hear what we have to say. And this woman is there. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Do you realize when Nicodemus, when Jesus told Nicodemus, you need to be born again, Nicodemus said, do I climb back into my mother's womb? Right? When, when Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, the Jews hearing that would say, it took 46 years to build this temple. I'm going to share something with you about religion in the world. Religion in the world, for the most part, is concerned about, we, we act like we're not scientists, but we, we might as well be, because we're worried about what you can see and what you can touch. Because for this woman, her religion had more to do with what she could see and what she could touch. And when God was trying to talk about living water, which was a spiritual reality, she did not even understand that this could be spiritual. She's like, you don't have a bucket and you don't have a rope. What are you, yeah, you're crazy. But brothers and sisters, God is not, here's the truth. You're made mind, body, and soul. How many of you realize this? You're not just physical. You're not just a meat bag. You don't, you don't just have organs and blood. You, you're more than that. Amen. You're more than that. You're made mind, body, and spiritual. You can have, you can be crippled and in bed and your mind can be fully active. Amen. I mean, what was that? Stephen Hawking's, his body was crippled and his body was broken down, but his mind was keen, right? Dear ones, your mind, body, and you are what? Spirit. And that's the part where everybody, listen, the scientists get the mind part and the body part, but the spirit part's really uncomfortable, even down to this day. What does that mean? Well, you want to know why I think it's so broken, why it's so uncomfortable, and why it's so, so unclear? We, how many of you get nervous when somebody is a spiritualist? I do. Tree and I were looking at a home one time, and we went in the garage, and behind the piano, there was a piano in the garage, that was strange to begin with, but behind the piano were all these candles and an altar, and there was clearly things, feathers, things being offered. I was like, Tria, we're not buying this house. So whoever lived here was into stuff that I don't care to know anything about, right? We're uncomfortable with that. But may I suggest to you the reason why mankind today is uncomfortable with spirituality is the same reason Jesus is offering this woman living water. Because the Bible says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. The physical, the mental, the homes, the, cl- the, the whatever it is that you need. But you got to seek first the what? And let me ask you a question. Where is the kingdom of God? Is the, amen. But is the kingdom of God of this world? Is the kingdom of God terrestrial? Is it built out of carbon? No, the kingdom of God is not of this world. If Jesus says, if, if the kingdom of God were of this world, the servants of my God would fight for me. But the kingdom of God is out of this world. Is God physical or is he spiritual? God is spirit, the Bible says. So what I'm trying to say is, when he's offering her living water and she's thinking, Lord, this well is deep, or Jesus, or Rabbi, this well is deep. And, and he's like, no, 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 I'm talking about I'm not talking about Jew and Gentile. I'm not talking about white and black. I'm not talking about all these later things that have come along and have built up and hidden the fact that you were made, woman, to be connected to your creator. I want to reconnect you to your creator. 
You have, you have you bought into all the lies of religion. You bought into all the, the, the circumstances of the day. You don't even know that you don't have life. You are missing something, and I'm offering you what you're missing. And listen to what the Bible says. Well, actually, don't believe me. Believe the Bible. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2.13. It's not just this woman. That's why this story is recorded. It's everybody in this church, everybody in this world. This is what we've done. Jeremiah 2.13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of what? Who is the fountain of living waters? When, if, Jesus says, if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water, and it would become a spring of water, a fountain of water, inside your very heart. Where does Jesus want his Holy Spirit to reside? Who should be sitting on the throne of our lives? Where do they sit? Where, where does that happen? In the center of our being, amen? See, the problem is mankind has done two things wrong, massively wrong. And it's you and I inherited it. We can blame Adam and Eve, but we inherited this. First, we have forsaken the fountain of living waters. We forgot where life comes from. And the second thing is we've hewn cisterns, themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold no water. Not only have we forgotten that God is our source of life and joy, and everything, we, we, are, we are just mind and body if we don't connect to him spiritually. We're, we're, we're living a shadow of our lives. But not only have we forgotten that he is that source, we've tried to find other sources to replace him. Dear ones, we're about to learn something. She asked the question in John. She says to Jesus, are you greater than the, our father Jacob? And Jesus is about to prove to her that he actually is. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob? And Jesus answered and said to her, mm -mm -mm. whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Jacob gave you this well, yes, but you drink it and you're back here tomorrow. But I'm going to give you something that's going to make it so that you never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Listen, this woman has had a rough go. She doesn't want to come and draw water in the middle of the day. She wants to be the only woman that can stay home. By the way, you realize you could have been born in uh, the first century? You realize that God allowed you to, be, to exist in the 21st century where we have indoor plumbing. How many of you appreciate that? This last week, you know, I don't know what you do when you're sick, but when I'm sick and my kids were sick, I stay home, I, you know, we're in, our, we're in our pajamas and we're on a couch and we're watching old, like old timey movies. And we're watching this movie called Support Your Local Sheriff. Anybody ever see that with James Garner? I mean, there's not everything great about it, so you may not want to watch it. But, it, but, but by today's standards, it's a Hallmark movie. Anyhow, um, we were watching it, and in that movie, they, they were advertising that this, the mayor's house had a well inside the kitchen. They could pump water right in the kitchen. That's in the middle of the 18th, 19th century. I mean, for a long time, mankind has struggled to get what they need for life. And you and I just flip a switch and turn on the water. In fact, we have faucets now, you just wave at, right? You just put your hand under there and pop. I mean, talk about, if that woman could have seen today. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, go. By the way, this is the proof line that he is greater than, jo than Jacob. He's not proven it up to this point. And Joseph, he's about to prove it. He says, go call your husband and come here. Ooh. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And then Jesus says, you have well said you have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. By the way, I want to I share something with you. The Bible says the one that you now have is not your husband. It could be that it's not just because it's they're living together. It, that may not be her husband. It may be someone's husband, but it may not be hers. There may be a reason the women of this town don't want to draw water with her. Because she's married five of their sons or their brothers. Or she might be shacking up with one of their husbands now. And, and they don't want anything to do with her. And listen to what the woman says. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this sermon, um, I want to be mindful of our time. 
This is, this is such an epic story. I think we have time to get through it, and I, and I want to be mindful. The, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Do you realize that when she says, are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us this well? He says, well, go call your husband, and I'm going to give you this living water. And she said, I have no husband. And then he knows her, but he's never met her. Jesus, in this story, Jesus is human enough to be exhausted and thirsty. And he's divine enough to know her every detail of her life. Jesus is the only one who can fully relate to us and fully know us and fully save us. <laughs> you know, let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. What cistern have you dug in your life and you just keep trying to fill it thinking that it's going to satisfy you and it's going to give you what you need? For this woman, Jesus just touched on it. This woman believes that if she can find the right man, that, she, that, that her life will be right. And she went through man number one, man number two, man number three, man number four, man number five. And now she's like, maybe it's the marriage thing that doesn't work. And now she's just living with a man, Right? And in truth, in this first century, by the way, Jesus would later teach about, um, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he would teach about divorce. I don't think women, even in the Samaritan community, had the power to divorce their husbands. It was the husbands that had the power to dismiss the wives. So in, in reality, this is not because she is necessarily a, a profligate or a, a philandering woman. That's not necessarily the case. She just has been rejected by one person who's told her that they would love her, center packing. Second person, third person, fourth person, fifth person. And the sixth person, she's just like, just don't say it. Right? If you were her, imagine how she might feel. Imagine how miserable you might be if you've, if you've ever been through a divorce, and I've seen several. I have not been divorced, praise God. Tria is my first wife, and by God's grace, my only wife, amen? <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, and I'm not saying that you know, to brag, or I'm not saying that to, uh, to make anyone feel bad, but if you've been through a divorce, you know that that is a horribly painful thing. And this woman's been divorced five times. And Jesus, knowing that about her, what's about to happen, what this woman does, tells me that her day has been an absolute shocker. She was surprised to be, to, to be talked to, talk to by a, 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 a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, a male. Then, then she's surprised that this rabbi needs, wants water, and then she's surprised the rabbi offers her water. And then, and then she's really surprised when this rabbi knows her and he knows her well. Listen to what she says. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where you will not to worship. You know, have you, has anyone ever started talking about something in your life that you don't want to talk about? Have, have any mother here ever tried to approach your, your, with your son or your daughter about a conversation you want to have with them, but they're not ready to have? And they just definitely change the subject. And you're like, oh, come on. That's what, she's, this, that's what this woman's doing. She's like, you know, I perceive you're a prophet. You know, speaking of, if you know all these things, I, where, where should we worship? Not, let's not talk about my marriages. Let's not talk about my brokenness. Let's talk about, you know, this issue between the Jews and the Gentiles. Or the Jews and the Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship with the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This message that Jesus... Jesus does not get thrown off the track. This woman does not have the source of living water in her heart. And she tries to throw him off the track by talking about which mountain to worship on. And he brings it right back. The only way you're going to really worship God the way you ought to is if you worship in spirit and in truth. Mind, body, spirit. Our problem, mankind's problem, cannot be solved by physical laws, mental laws, physical chemi chemicals. Mankind's primary problem is because we have severed our spiritual connection to our creator God. And Jesus is laboring with this woman. And listen to what happens next. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Basically, listen, Jacob, you might be greater than Jacob. You're a prophet. But I'm going to wait for the Messiah to come. And he'll, he will explain all things to me. <laughs> she's, she's pushing back on Jesus. And listen to what Jesus says. I who speak to you am he. 
I who speak to you am he. Now, you may not realize how special that is that Jesus just did for this woman, but did you know that when Jesus was baptized, it was God the Father that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God testified of who Jesus was. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, who do you say that I am? It was, it was they that testified that he was the son of God, the savior of the world. This is the first time that Jesus has said it of himself. And he says it to a, a five-time divorced woman who is rejected by the Jewish community, the Samaritan community, and is drawing water all by herself in the heat of the day. He says, I who speak to you am he. The first person to hear the words out of Jesus' mouth that he is the Messiah is her. And listen to what happens. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Basically, Jesus is sitting down with this woman at the well, and they're having this conversation. And, and however it, was, it started, I mean, they're both engaged now, and the disciples come back with food, and they, they've got their Taco Bell bags, and they've got what Jesus ordered, and they're like, what is he doing? But no one felt comfortable to call him out and say, ah, because after all, this is the same Jesus that cast the rabbis out of the temple just a couple weeks before that. If you walk with Jesus, if you, if you travel with Jesus, Jesus is going to make you super uncomfortable. And this was one of those moments, but they learned just to shut up and listen. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with this woman. Why are you talking to the woman? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city and said to the men, what, what pushed that woman away? She was talking to Jesus. She was having a conversation with Jesus. The disciples, the early church showed up, and then she didn't feel comfortable there anymore. It was time to go. But when she went back, guess what? She must have thought to herself, I don't care what those guys think. I want an, I want, I have, I've had an experience today that I have got to share. Dear ones, how many of you want your, your sins to be on blast? How many of you would like to come to church one day and all your sins be on the screens up here? Would you stick around? I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> right? How many of you would like someone to know every intricate detail of your brokenness? And, and if they knew that, would you want to silence said person? Or would you want to bring everybody to that said person? There's something about Jesus and the way he interacted with sinners. That when he identified their broken sister and that they've been trying to fill to the best of their ability... When he identifies that, they don't feel condemned by him. They feel loved by him. Does that make sense? If you can't approach someone who's broken down and is, is clearly living a, a lifestyle that is not according to the Bible, if you can't approach them with as much love and pity and tenderness as Jesus, then you are not the one to approach them. Amen? Jesus identifies. He says, bring your husband. She goes, oh, I don't have a husband. That's right. You said truly. You've had five. And the one you're now with is not your husband. And that, all of those conversations, watch what this woman does. She leaves, she goes into the city and said to the men, she said to the men, the Bible doesn't say she said to the women, the women don't want to see her or hear her, they, are, they hate her. <laughs> but she said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Dear ones, when you go to share Jesus with others, do you come trying to give your answers or do you just invite them and say, come and see? Ask your questions. This woman is a phenomenal evangelist. She went from a, a broken pariah of society to, the, to a phenomenal evangelist. She says, come see a man who said everything I ever did. Her life is the, is the subject of conversation for Sychar. They talk about her. Did you see what she did lately? <gasps> Do you know who she's with now? And instead of being embarrassed by that, she says, come and see the man who knows everything I've ever done. And they've, they've all just been discussing details, but now there's an opportunity to learn everything. And she's not afraid of it. She's inviting them to see if this is the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is amazing. The Bible says, he said to them, uh, because they, they went, uh, could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say um, there are four months till the harvest? Behold, I say to you, look up for the, the, the fields are ripe for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. 
For in this, uh, for in this time, or oh, pardon me, for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you have not labored for, others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Jesus called these disciples, he's turning them into fishers of men, and they don't understand why Jesus would even talk to a Samaritan, and he's trying to explain to them, we are fishing for all men. We are not fishing for Jews. We're not fishing for righteous men. We're not fishing for heterosexual men. We're not fishing for Christian men. We're not fishing for the honest men, good men. We're fishing for all men. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? And to his disciples, he's saying, listen, the fields are ripe for harvest, but the problem is the workers are blind. They don't believe that someone is who's so recalcitrant, set in sin, five times divorced, and, and is now living in an adulterous relationship. They don't believe that person is ready to give their life to Christ. But Jesus says, they are ready. They, more than you, are sick and tired of Satan's wares, because Satan's wares wear thin. You know, when I was, uh, when I was going to a, a public university, I always struggled falling in love with Jesus on the Adventist campus. It's the weirdest thing. I go to an Adventist school, and I couldn't fall in love with Jesus there. It seemed like the trend was to rebel. But I went to a public campus where nobody could give a rip about Christ, and that's where I fell in love with Jesus. Because it's when I was surrounded by people who had no hope, who had no profession, who didn't love the Lord, that I realized how empty that life really is. I was hungry in a place where I could see this was not the life for me. But sometimes when we're surrounded by church members and we're surrounded by Christians, you know, we, 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 we don't understand the blessings that we're surrounded by. And listen to what the Bible says. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there what? Two days. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was on his way to Galilee, but he had to go to Sychar. His disciples, they went in a group probably because they didn't want to shop in a Samaritan city alone. They wanted to roll heavy into that city just in case there was a scuffle, right? They left Jesus at the well, and Jesus not only talks to a Samaritan woman, he talks to all the Samaritans there. And the town of Sychar meets Jesus in a way which so far Jerusalem hasn't. And he leaves, he goes on to Galilee, and the people of Sychar are connected to the fountain of living water. Dear ones, I want to ask you a question. Are you trying to solve your spiritual problems with physical solutions? Do you think that by dressing differently like the Jews were faithful to do? Do you think by eating differently like the Jews were careful to do? Do you think by some combination of religious outward things, you can somehow get right with God? Then you will be as prejudiced as the Jews were toward the Samaritans. Because what they were prejudiced about were the outside things. The color of people's skins, the language, these outer things. You and I, I, I can't fix what's wrong with your heart, but I know one who can. Well, the reason you have sin in your life is because your heart is aimed at the wrong thing. And I can try to tell you, hey, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal. But as long as you have that evil heart beating in your chest, and you're not connected to the fountain of living water, you're going to be hungry, and Satan is going to be able to take advantage of your weakness, and he's going to convince you that that's actually... That might be true, you don't steal, but you know, you know better than God does about who you should date, who you should marry. You know better than God does about how you should live your life and what you should put first. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think of, of, of thieves as people who, who are just trying to fill the cistern with the wrong kind of water. I want you to think of homosexuals as people who just like the rest, heterosexuals without Christ, are just trying to fill their hearts with love, but it's the wrong source of love. Amen? I want you to think of people, no matter what they're into, no matter what they struggle with, no matter what they look like, I want you to think of Islamic terrorists as people who are zealous to, to, to honor God, but they don't understand. They're trying to honor God in the wrong way. Because their hearts... Are, they're, not, they don't, they're not connected to the fountain of living water. You know what happens when uh, you're connected to the fountain of living water? You're not thirsty and you're not hungry anymore. It's very hard for Satan to come knock on the door of your heart and say, hey, follow me, I've got a better way, when you are truly satisfied. How many of you have ever made the mistake of going grocery shopping when you're starving? 
That's the, right, that's the greatest way to blow your budget and eat a whole bunch of carbs, right? But if you go grocery shopping when you're satisfied, you can make good decisions. If you're trying to live life without the living water on the inside, you're going to make a series of bad decisions. And society is not fair. God is. God sees us all as sinners. But society will categorize you differently. These people are super bad. These people are kind of bad. These people are almost good, right? And God is like, Jesus is saying, the fields are ripe for harvest. Are you willing to put your prejudice down? I'm going to close this sermon with this story. And I know we're a little bit over time. There was a man in this community. Uh, I'm scared to share this story, but I'll share it. And he was, um, he was openly homosexual. He was living with a man. His father died, and he was living with a man. And his, we, had, we had the funeral here for his father. And, uh, and for a time, the relationship he had with the man was enough for him. It was enough. It was enough. It, was, it, it filled his heart well enough that that's who he was, and he was strong about it, and that was, that was who this man was. But he wanted to come to church. And I remember it was 10 years ago when I was here. I used to sit over here, and I, I felt convicted. This, this man belongs in church. Where is he going to learn about Jesus? Where is he going to fall in love with the source of living water? Is he going to fall in love with it in the world? He, why can't he fall in love with Jesus right here in this church? Amen? And so I would tell him, like, man, you sit with me. You sit with my wife. You sit with our family, okay? And there were members that would tell me, the Bible says that God has given these people a reprobate mind. There's no point for them being in the church. They're lost. There's no, there's no hope for them. And I said to myself, man, that doesn't sound like Jesus. I don't know of any sin, any brokenness that Jesus can't heal. And so I said, no, man, you sit with us. You sit with us. Well, I've kept up with this person throughout, the, throughout time. And it's no doubt about it. He, like me, struggles with sin, right? But what's amazing is, some time ago, he called me. And he said, Ben, the only man I need in my life is the man Jesus Christ. Somehow, some way, God got through to him that what you're looking for in all these other relationships is what you can find in a relationship with me. And so I want to I talk to you for a minute, and I want to level with you. If you are struggling with alcohol addiction, if you're struggling with, with, with some sort of chemical dependence, if you're struggling with pornography, if you're struggling with overspending, or if, if for you, when you're down, you go out and you just shop, 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 you know what I mean? And you're doing retail therapy. If, if you're hungering and thirsting and you're not, you don't, you don't know satisfaction. It's not a physical problem. It's not a mental problem. It's a spiritual problem. You need to have Jesus come in and give you the fountain of living waters. And by the way, I don't really understand all that because I'm, I'm fully physical, fully spiritual, I'm fully mental, and I, I'm just learning to become eh, fully mental, get that? <laughs> uh, and, and I'm just learning what it means to be spiritual. But I'll tell you this, in Revelation 21, I want to finish with this. Revelation 21 says this, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Whoever desires. Do you understand that it's not the, the careful Seventh-day Adventist Christian that is necessarily going to be your neighbor in heaven. It's going to be those who have accepted the free gift of salvation. And I want, I want my Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters to be in heaven. Amen? But religion alone cannot do that for you. It's got to be Jesus Christ. And if you're a Seventh-day Adventist without the living water in your heart, then you are a miserable person because you're, you know what's right, you're trying to live it, but you don't have it on the inside. I've been there before, and I'm appealing to you because Jesus was appealing to the Jews. He was appealing to his disciples. He was saying, you guys think you know. You think you know, but you don't know. I am the, I am the thing that you need. I am the thing that she needs. I am the thing that Sychar needs. I am the thing Jerusalem needs. Jesus is what we need today. How many of you are willing to say, Lord, <laughs> there is no, there is no, there is nothing like you, Jesus. There is nothing more important than you, Jesus. And, and how many of you are willing to say, when Jesus says, I am the one, the one who speaks to you is, is he. How many of you are willing to say today, Jesus, I want that living water in my soul. 
I want it to be springing up into everlasting life. I want more joy. I want there to be, listen, I don't want a water pressure problem in my heart. I want there to be a gusher of love coming out of me for everyone that I see. Amen? So that when I run into somebody that maybe another Christian has no use for, that gusher in me says, oh, you are a person whom Christ died for. You are a person for whom Christ died for. I love you. God loves you. You belong in the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is ready and willing to change hearts and harvest and bring us all home. But are we, the 21st century disciples, willing to change our prejudice, willing to change the way we see things? Do you believe your Savior can change people's persuasions? I hope so, because I'm looking at sinners out there, and if you're not changed, if you don't believe that, then we got a problem, right? Listen, I struggle. I struggle with sin, but guess what? I have a Savior who's man enough for the challenge. And I trust him to do what needs to be done in my life. And I trust him to do what needs to be done in yours. And if he can save me, he can save anybody. You want to pray with me? Let's pray. Oh, loving Lord, we've spent a little extra time today. We've talked about this woman at the well. And Father, the people of Samaritan, the Samaritans in Sychar wouldn't talk to her. She didn't want to hear what they had to say anyways. Lord, the Jews wouldn't talk to her. The males especially had no use for her. And yet, Lord, you've shown us in this story that whoever we should be prejudiced against, whoever we should be worried about, whoever we should think, oh, man, I'm afraid of what to say. That, those are the people. <laughs> those are the people that when you share your love through us and the world says you shouldn't love each other and we actually love each other the way God loved this woman in this story, when we, are, when we, when we know each other and still love each other and believe that, that you want both of us in your kingdom, that there is nothing that you can't solve. There's no sin. There's no cistern that can't be filled in and the well of springing, a, a, the river of water of life that comes from a connection with our creator God. You can reconnect to homosexuals. You can, create, you can reconnect to drug addicts. You can reconnect to, to Seventh-day Adventist Christians who have long thought that they were the only ones going to be in the kingdom of God. Lord, you are ready and you are willing. Help us to be as ready and willing as you. Help us, dear Jesus, to really see you as the solution to this world. And Father, wherever you take us from here, wherever, whoever we met, meet this week, may we not look at them with eyes like the disciples of old, but may we look at them with eyes like our Savior, who is alive and well today and wants to live in us and through us and love others effectively through us. Lord, I, I, I'm asking forgiveness. I'm asking forgiveness when I have failed as a pastor and I represent you and I have failed to show love equally to all men and women. I ask forgiveness when, when I have judged or, or been judgmental, either by my silence or by my attitude, or, or just failed to, to, to reflect you. And I'm wondering if there's anyone here to, today that's willing to ask God for forgiveness. That we, we know we're the disciples of Christ. We say we're the disciples of Christ, but yet we don't know exactly how to love people who, who are radically different from us. That if, if, if we're a strong Democrat, then we don't know how to love Republicans. If we're, if we're heterosexual, we don't know how to love homosexuals. We, if, if there's any church member today that realizes they don't speak love, they don't think love, they don't act loving like Jesus did in this story, Lord, you're willing to forgive us of any sin we're willing to confess. And I'm, I'm ready and willing to say, I confess, I don't have enough of that everlasting water of life in me to meet some of these challenges. So forgive me, Lord. Forgive these precious people. Give us the everlasting water of life while there's still time. And may the, the harvest be so plentiful. May the joy of the Lord be so strong. Lord, the truth is this. I don't give a rip of what I want or what I think or what I think is most important. I'm convicted of this, that you are most important. And I want your will to be done in my life. And I believe if I can come to that conclusion as a, as a recovering addict, as I, if I can come to that conclusion, then no matter where anyone else is at, they can come to that conclusion that Jesus Christ is what matters most. And it's not about me. It's not about my preferences or my prejudice. It's about you. Lord, do something in the Port Charlotte SDA church. When we start loving like this, when we start thinking like this, this church cannot remain empty. And Port Charlotte will not remain untouched. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. We're going to sing the wonderful words of life. Thank you.